Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Inside Guns with your host, me, the Yankee Marshall. Today, I want to take some time to answer a question that I get all the time from viewers, especially viewers who come to my live chats and see the inside of my gun room, because that's where I do my live chats from. The question they ask is, how do you afford all those guns? How do you pay for all those? I mean, I was born a poor little white boy in West Virginia. I mean, how could I possibly afford to pay for these guns? Well, it's not what you think. Now, the thing I get asked most often is, are you wealthy? No, I am not wealthy. I'm not even close to wealthy. Even if I sold all my guns, I wouldn't be close to wealthy. I would definitely be wealthier if I had never bought a gun in my life. But that's not the case. I am definitely not wealthy. I am firmly rooted in the middle class. I am, at best, your basic middle class Karen. So, not wealthy at all. So, people might start thinking, well, how do you afford those guns if you're not wealthy? You have to be wealthy or you're doing something. Well, you know, it's not what you think. You know, it's not this. And it's not this. At least not anymore. You know, I'm getting older. I don't have those options anymore. And you know what? No matter what anyone says, it's not this. No matter what it says on the uh, restroom wall of any truck stop anywhere, that's just not true. Uh, and, you know, it's also not this. At, you know, at least not often. Not very often this. It's seldom this. Let's just say that. But the way I pay for my guns is that I have priorities uh, I'm not saying my priorities are better than yours. I'm just saying I have personal priorities on what I will spend my money on. And I'm old. I've been doing it for a long time, so I've had time to accumulate things. So if you look at the amount of time I've been buying guns for, you got to think, the first time I bought my own handgun, you know, a Smith, uh, it was, excuse me, it was a Taurus 357, uh, no, it wasn't. God, I'm getting it wrong. It was a Taurus, it was a long time ago, people. It was a Taurus 22 Magnum revolver. I bought that gun, was my first gun, the first handgun I ever bought myself with my own money. I got a, my first rifle when I was eight, a 22 Marlin. Got my first handgun that I purchased myself when I was 18. Uh, and that was over 35 years ago. So it's been a while. So I've been collecting guns for a very long time. I've always owned guns. There hasn't been a time period in my life where I didn't own guns. And I'm not saying all the ones I own now are the ones I collected over all that time, but they're ones that I, you know, bought something in 20 years ago and then maybe traded it for something I have now. So it has been a cumulative thing. So until you've been collecting for 35 years, don't look at my collection and go, how'd he do that? Or I wish I could do that because you can. You got time if you're young, especially. Uh, but also, like I say, over those 35 years, I have been spending my money on guns and not other things that a lot of people spend money on. Uh, I obviously don't spend money on clothes. Uh, most everything I wear, t-shirts wise, are given to me. Uh, as far as other things go, I mean, I have underwear, I guarantee you, are older than some of the people watching this right now. Most of my jeans are older than some of the people watching this right now. And I think I only have three pairs. Uh, so clothes horse is not something that I can be accused of being. I'm just not a fashionista at all. I know, I know you look at me and you're like, what? You're not a fashionista? Oh, man. But it's true. I'm just not. I just happen to be pretty and it makes it look, make, just makes everything I wear look good. So I don't spend money on stuff like that. I don't spend money on uh, going out and eating fancy meals. My kids think Outback's a fancy restaurant because we don't go to fancy places. I don't go somewhere and spend, you know, a hundred bucks a plate for food. I could go to the grocery store and get stuff and make it better at home for that price. So I don't blow money there. The only things I really blow money on for myself are my car and my guns. You basically either got to put oil in it or on it for it to function properly for me to buy it and spend money on it. That's just the way I am. And the main things I don't spend money on, that a lot of people spend money on, who say that, oh, there's just no way, even if I had 35 years, I couldn't accumulate those things. Well, two of the biggest things that I don't do that allows me to buy guns is I don't smoke and I don't drink alcohol. If you look at how much people smoke and drink in this country and how much money they spend on that and fancy foods and other things on top of it, then it's easy to spend a lot of money every year and wonder where it went. I mean, if you look, and I've got these numbers written down here, 
I looked up what the average person who smokes cigarettes spends and what the per average person who calls themselves a drinker, what they spend on average. Uh, on average a week for uh, people who smoke, it's $30 a week. That's uh, over uh, uh, $1,560 uh, a year. With, its, with alcohol, it's an average of 50 to 70, depending on what kind of uh, alcohol they drink. And even at the low end, you know, that's... $2,600 a year that they spend on alcohol. It's a lot of alcohol, a lot of uh, cigarettes. That's a lot of money. When you add those two things together, that's over $4,000 the average person spends on cigarettes and alcohol every year. So imagine 35 years of spending $4,000 a year. That's like $140,000. My collection's current value is only around $100,000. So 40,000 is, I don't know where it went. Uh, and you gotta remember, the value it has now, that doesn't mean that's what I paid for it. I've got guns now that are worth three, four $4,000 that I paid $500 for. My Colt Python, my stainless four inch Colt Python, the original Python, that's worth like 2,500 bucks right now. I paid, I think 600 bucks for it. So I didn't even spend that much money to get up to that 100,000. When people see, well, you got a $100,000 gun collection, they think, wow, you must be rich and you must spend a lot of money. No, it's just not the case. It's priorities. Like I said, don't smoke, don't drink. That saves me a lot of money. And I see this all the time with people. Like I have a cousin and his wife uh, that they're always like, we don't have enough money for this and we don't have enough money for that. But they both smoke and they drink. And we sat down once and I figured it up with them. And they were spending uh, about $190 a week on cigarettes and alcohol. Six pack a day, so many cases a week, you know, uh, uh, so many cartons of cigarettes, so many packs of cigarettes. And they usually bought them by the pack. They wouldn't even buy them by the carton because I'd say, well, if you bought them by the carton, you'd save money. Well, yeah, but they don't have to have all the money up front. So they buy them by the carton. So, I mean, they were spending... Uh, between nine and ten thousand dollars of the of the thirty thousand they brought home every year on alcohol and cigarettes. So I was like, imagine if you spent that on other things. If you'd put it away for a house, how long would it take you to save up enough money? To, this is West Virginia. If they saved for ten years, they could buy a house. You know, so uh, it's just where you choose to spend your money. That's the thing. So the two, the two things that really make it to where I can have the guns I have, it's not being wealthy. It's just having a priority where I only spend money on certain things and then not having the other vices that a lot of people spend money on, specifically alcohol and cigarettes. And then clothes and fancy dinners and partying and traveling. I don't travel anymore. I used to travel when we made good money, but it all just adds up. And if you're not blowing it on that stuff, uh, you can really put it towards something else. Like I say, it just depends. What are your priorities? Mine is my guns and my car. And that's what I spend my money on. And that's why that coupled with time is why my gun collection is as nice as it is. All right, everybody, I want to move on to my favorite part of the show. And that is gun talk. And today I want to talk about my Sig Sauer AXG P320 Classic. A lot of people already know that I bought this gun. And I've done some changes to it. Changed the recoil spring and guide rod. Uh, changed out uh, the trigger. Just made it a little bit nicer. Because I thought, hmm, I like this gun so much, I might put it in my carry rotation. But there's one thing that I don't like about the gun. See, it comes cut for a red dot but it doesn't have sights that allow you to co-witness with a red dot. It came with regular standard height sights. So I'm going to have to change those if I want to put a red dot on it and carry it. Because why would I carry a gun cut for a red dot if I didn't put a red dot on it? So I decided I'm going to order me some sights from excess sights and put them on here, some suppressor sight heights, uh, height sights, get a little tongue twister there, so that I can actually put this gun into my carry rotation after I can get a red dot for it. So I ordered some and I said, how hard can it be? It's changing sights. I change sights all the time. This will be a breeze. So today I wanted to show you that installation and show you how much of a breeze it actually was. This is the one 
don't fucking budge. Uh, about fucking time. I hope the back one's not as hard. And the oh, back one goes the opposite direction, I do believe. Oh yeah, that one's moving already. That was a lot easier than the front one, that's for sure. I may not have to cuss nearly as much on this one. All right, that one's out now. Rear one and the back front one are out. And uh, I actually managed to do it without destroying them. These are nice sights. I'm gonna put them on one of my other SIGs. These will actually fit on my, uh, uh, I believe it was, I think they'll fit on my P239 maybe, which just has white dot sights on it. So this will be a nice upgrade for my 239. If not, I'll put them on my 229 that just has a regular three dot sight on it. All right, now I just gotta get the channels cleaned out and ready to put the new sights in. All right, now that I got the sights out, I'm gonna take some bore cleaner here. Just clean everything, degrease it in the little slots here I'm talking. Before I go any further, I wanna show a little tip here. If you get some brass on your gun here, like you got brass left over from the brass punch, something that usually takes that right off is liquid bluing. It really will take it off there. I don't know what's in the bluing that takes it off, but you can scrub it with other stuff. It won't come off. The liquid bluing takes it right off. All right, now we're gonna put on the suppressor height sights, the F8 night sights from XS sights. So let's go ahead and put that on there. All right, let's try dry fitting them a little bit here. Probably gonna to have to take a little bit off the front sight, which is normal. Let's try the back sight, the rear sight here. Hmm, it might actually not need anything off. It might go in right the way it is. We will see here, we will see. Now the fitting required is usually just a tiny amount. I usually won't even use a file. I'll just use a little piece of five or 600 grit sandpaper. It just rub it on it just a little bit. And as you can see there, it just takes the edges down a little bit and that's what you want. Now let's tap it in place. Mm, might need a little more off of it. Still a little tight. Remember, it's always better to do too little than too much. Because you can always take a little more off. You can't put it back on. Now let's tap it back in. Okay, I think I've got it just perfectly centered right now. Yep. Looks like that's got her. So now we can move on to the back sight. Oh, in case you see anybody's wondering here, the rag is here because I had to go buy a new uh, vise. So I couldn't find my old vise. And since I couldn't find my old vise, I also couldn't find the rubber things on it that hold things in place. And they didn't have any anywhere. I looked several different places, didn't have any. So I uh, have to use a rag here to keep from marring up my sight. Does make it a little harder to get it tightened down in there, but you know, it does it. I said I didn't think I was gonna need to take much off the back. Let's just take a tiny, let's just smooth out the bottom here. Oh, well, make sure you don't put it in backwards. All right, before I put this back on the gun, I do want to point out one thing. I had to fit this rear sight a lot. I uh, did it a lot while I was watching a movie last night in the house. Got yelled at quite a bit for trying to tap the sight in and out while I was fitting it. But then once it was fit in there, I had worn away a lot of the finish on the bevel of the sight, and you can see it on the sides. So I had to refinish this site. So I just taped it off and I put some Wheeler Ceramic Coat on it, rebaked it, uh, which is why the sights are blacker than usual. I actually like them black like this because then they match uh, the screws and stuff because before they're just kind of a dark gray. 
So had to do that to make them nice again. Now you might ask yourself, how do you do that if you have a tritium vial in them? How do you do that without covering that up? Well, that's real easy. It's too small to tape. But what you do is you just take a, a toothpick, a sharp toothpick, the round ones preferably, not the flat ones, and you just dip it in a little bit of Elmer's glue and then just put a little dab of Elmer's glue right on the tritium vial. Let it dry for like 20 minutes. Then coat your rear sight after it's taped off. And then once you have as many coats on there as you want, usually two to three, you just pop off the little piece of dried glue with the toothpick and then fire it and you're fine because then there's nothing on the front of the little lens there. So that's a little secret on how to refinish your sights, uh, especially after they're already on a gun. All right, now that I've got it uh, all ready to go here and refinished, I'm just gonna put a little bit of Loctite on all the little crevices here, just squirt it in. Don't know if you can see on camera, but just giving it a good little coat of Loctite to where it's puddled up around where I need it. Then I'm gonna let that set for a few minutes and I'll come back and I'll Q-tip it clean. All right, now that it has sat for a little while, just gonna come through with my Q-tip and get all the excess off there. You just don't want that to harden up and goop up. You just wanna let it soak into all the little nooks and crannies. And now that it's done that, I'll take off all the excess. And this should be ready to go. All right, as you can see, the sights are on there now, but it was not easy. Uh, every time I change the sights on a Sig Sauer handgun, I say, never again. Not worth it. Take it to a gunsmith, give them the 30 or 50 bucks, whatever. It would be well worth it to do that because it is a nightmare. But unfortunately, every time I do that and then make that oath to myself, a year goes by, I forget, and I go through the whole process again. But I'll tell you what, if you ever consider changing the sights on uh, a Sig Sauer and you don't want to take it to a gunsmith, before you make that decision, have one of your best friends just kick you in the balls as hard as they can. And then think to yourself, this is a more pleasant experience than changing the sights on a Sig. And then decide if you think it's worth it to take it to a gunsmith. Because like I say, Never again will I be changing them. They're just a pain in the ass. But there you go. They're on there now. So now all I got to do is decide what red dot I'm going to be putting on this gun. All right, everybody. I want to end the show today with our pet rescue of the day. And today we have Charlie Cat, which I don't really understand that name because apparently it's a female. And we know it's a cat. You can see it's a cat. So I don't know why Charlie, and I don't know, I guess Charlie's interchangeable male and female. I don't even think you gotta spell it different, but I don't know why the hyphen cat is needed. Uh, Cause it's, we didn't think it was a buffalo, but there you go. There's Charlie Cat. Uh, Charlie Cat is a rescue off the street. Uh, she was rescued by Miguel T. And like I said, right off the street, which is another thing I like to remind people is sometimes you don't even have to go to a shelter. You don't have to pay that adoption fee. Just take a cat in that needs help, a dog in that needs help off the street. It's so obvious sometimes that there's just strays around that no one cares about. Take them in, give them a good home. Uh, Miguel, I believe, did the thing like I always do, put out food and water for them, and they just, you know, live their natural life outside, but they have a source of food and water. And then apparently he took a liking to Charlie Cat, and they became a member of the family. Now, I do not approve of giving a cat firearms. Uh, that's not a good idea as far as I'm concerned, because if they figure out how to use them, a lot of dogs are in trouble. Uh, although I would say, doesn't Charlie look a little bit disgusted that they're like, it's like a Glock? and a PSD from uh, FK Burnham. Doesn't seem to be into the uh, polymer guns. Or maybe she's just pissed that they're not loaded. I think that might be it. She's like, fuck, give me guns and don't load it. Mm. But I just wanted to show Charlie today. And I wanted to uh, say congratulations to her for finding her forever home. And thank you for to Miguel T for being the type of person that will bring a little kitty in need in off the street, like I said, and give it the love it deserves. All right, everybody, that's our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you come back again tomorrow. Until then, I just want to sign off as usual by saying, as far as the state of the world today is concerned, you know, it is what it is. It could be a lot worse, trust me, but it could also be better. But if we as a community start to realize that the people you think are out there fighting for your rights, they're really not. They're profiteers, they're propagandists. 
They're people who want to manipulate you through fear and anger to support their financial interests, the interests of the industry, not the in uh, interest of the people. If we can get that through our heads and start ignoring these people, what things will be in the very near future for people who believe in gun rights and uh, freedom in general is better.